America's middle class has found itself under siege in recent years from globalization, technological change, budget cuts, and now, of course, crushing economic damage from the COVID-19 pandemic. And these pressures have had profound social, economic, and political consequences in the United States and equally significant consequences for US foreign policy. They explain in part Donald Trump's rise to the presidency. And now Joe Biden as president elect has pledged, and I'm quoting here, to equip our people to succeed in a global economy with a foreign policy for the middle class. So what will this actually mean? How can US foreign policy support the aspirations of a middle class in crisis? And what will it mean for US global leadership? And finally, what does all this mean for Australia? Well, I'm really delighted today to be joined by Rosalind Engel and Darren Lim to help tease out the answers to these questions. Rosalind is the co-editor of a new Carnegie Endowment study on just this subject. In fact, the report is called Making US Foreign Policy Work Better for the Middle Class. If you have the time, I really encourage you to have a look at the report, both for its excellent analysis of how we got here, but also for its thoughtful reflections on policy responses. Rosalind's a non-resident scholar in the Geoeconomics and Strategy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and also a Professor of Practice in Economics at the US Naval Academy. Rosalind served with dis distinction in a number of senior US government roles, including at the US Treasury and at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, Darren uh, is a senior lecturer in the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the Australian National University, from where we are broadcasting today. He ranges broadly over some very big topics, including geoeconomics, grand strategy in the international order, and strategic developments in the Indo-Pacific. Darren is also co-host of the excellent Australia in the World podcast and a regular contributor to the public discussion on Australian foreign policy challenges. Rosalind and Darren, it's really a great pleasure to have you both here. Now, just before we start the conversation, just a quick administrative point. If you have a question that you'd like to pose to the panel, please post it in the Q&A box and then raise your hand and use the raise your hand icon in the toolbar. Um, we'll try and get to questions uh, as they come up. Uh, if you'd like to ask your, the question yourself, we will be able to make you live, that is promote you if you like to a panelist and you'll appear on screen and you'll be able to ask the question yourself. Alternatively, I can ask it uh, on your behalf. Uh, if you prefer uh, me just to ask your question, just type not live in front of the question uh, and then I will do it. Now, just before we get going, I just wanted to check Rosalind and Darren that you're all okay and ready to go. Both ready to go. All right, well, Rosalind, let's, let's start with you. The, the study you co-edited um, says that America's middle class finds itself in a precarious state and you quote a very telling Pew Research Center poll of 2019 in which nearly 70% of Americans surveyed, quite a staggering number really, I said that they expected their children to be either worse off or no better financially from their parents. So how, how did it come to this? What, what set of circumstances has created this uh, precarious state for the, the great American middle class? Uh, sure. Well, first, thank you very much for having me today. It's um, really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and I also wanted to do one quick kind of um, scene setting, if that's okay, before I just jump into that question, um, just to make sure people knew a teeny bit about the report, um, uh, just, just kind of create some context. So first of all, the report was um, really developed and guided by a bipartisan task force. And we could talk a little bit about more a little later about who was on that task force. It's kind of interesting. Um, we worked over three years to try to get a better understanding of how American middle-class households viewed foreign policy. 
We actually started with and built off three detailed state level reports, Ohio, Colorado, and Nebraska, which I might talk a, lot, a little bit about here and there. Um, and so it was a little bit different from your typical foreign policy study. We talked to lots and lots of people outside the Beltway, as we say, local business leaders, university export, experts, state local officials, economic development teams, and lots of middle class Americans. So I just wanted to put that out there because um, that's kind of the perspective that I'm going to bring, I think, to some of these comments uh, today. So in terms of kind of how we got here and what's going on, we did hear a lot in these hundreds of conversations that we had about kind of the state of the American middle class, and it largely mirrored that rather dismal statistic that you just mentioned. Um, I think the biggest issue for the American middle class has been the sluggish growth of employment earnings, particularly in the middle income entitled. Um, middle class households um, really depend, you know, for the vast bulk of their income on work. And work has just not been paying quite the way it used to um, in the United States. Um, just one quick statistic, you know, and this is pretty typical of, of other places as well, their advanced economies, but labor share of national income has been declining for years um, from roughly 64% of all national income before 2000 to, I think it's now down to 58%. Um, and that has to do with things like structural shifts in the economy, We've lost a lot of jobs in goods, pay, uh, goods producing industries based on manufacturing. So we've shifted, um, it used to be something like 27% of all jobs in 1980 were in these manufacturing um, uh, sector and now it's down to about 14%. Um, and so, you know, a lot of jobs have migrated into the service sector and for those who do not have higher education, that's meant some declining um, wages or stagnating wages. So another quick statistic from the United States, you know, GDP in the United States has tripled since 1980, but median earnings of, of the typical male in the United States who worked full time and year round is essentially the same as it was in 1980. So it's been difficult for people who go to work every day and work full time year round to get ahead. Um, and I think that's really what's mostly behind the statistic. But I just mentioned a couple other stresses on American middle class households. One is just a general rise in income inequality, which I mentioned just a bit before. Um, but another way to think of this is that if you look at the share of national income that's going to the middle three quintiles in the United States, it's declined from something like 53% in 1970 to 45% today. Um, and fiscal policies in the US, our tax spending and transfer programs are just not really doing a lot to help those middle income quintiles. It does a little bit to help the lowest quintiles, but it's not doing a lot for middle income quintiles. And then we had a financial crisis and we now have COVID. And so we also have a sense of diminished financial security. Um, so, you know, even by 2016 in the United States, the median net worth of the middle quintile um, was really basically just where it was in the late 1990s. It just had not really recovered. It took a very long time. So we have all of that. And then we also have some rising costs of living, um, actually not for durable goods. So, you know, things like, you know, I don't know, like household appliances, clothing, other things, that's actually been fairly stable, largely because of trade. But non-tradable services, education, childcare, medical care, all of those have been going up. And so you see this kind of squeeze on middle class households with stagnating or very slow growth in income, um, you know, sort of diminished financial security, so less of a financial cushion, rising costs for things like uh, services. And I would add, um, you know, we've had some you know, really weak uh, infrastructure investment in the United States. So we don't even have kind of the infrastructure there um, to support some middle class households. So I think that's really behind a lot of what you're seeing when you see a statistic um, like the one that you just mentioned. Great, thanks, um, Rosalind. So how much of that, um, those circumstances, do you think explains uh, uh, Donald Trump's rise to the presidency and the the very deep social and political divides that we all see now in the United States. 
I mean, I think they're really critical. Um, you know, it's, you know, the election of 2016 was just a, a you know, a, a serious and pretty unequivocal repudiation of the Washington establishment and the policy status quo. You know, it was the protest vote. Um, you know, in, in domestic policy, there's lots of problems. Um, you know, we've had kind of a policy almost paralysis um, since 2010 when you had a Republican Congress come in um, and really block a lot of what the Obama administration at that time was trying to do. Um, and in foreign policy, um, you know, since 2016, you know, we had President Trump with his kind of Make America Great Again campaign and the America First national security strategy, you know, really have this very marked departure in US foreign policy away from free trade, away from sort of more generous immigration stance, away from closer cooperation or close cooperation with allies or multilateral institutions, you know, away from a traditional emphasis in US foreign policy on democracy and human rights. Um, it's been a really significant shift um, in terms of the US foreign policy stance. Um, and I think, you know, this disgruntlement, this frustration, um, this sense that the system isn't working for a lot of people, that Washington isn't delivering, I think was absolutely an important part of what happened. You know, and I think it's kind of important to remember, you know, the economic and political geographies of the United States are pretty complex. You know, it's a really big country. One of the reasons what we, we talked to and spent some time in three different states was trying to really, you know, get a feel for some of what, you know, in the United States is not so flatteringly called flyover country. Um, but, you know, those geographies don't completely align, but they do sort of rhyme, right? So it's not that surprising, right, that the Midwest has been a major swing area that's lost millions of manufacturing jobs. Um, and it's still struggling to, to recover and diversify and move into sort of a, a more solid place um, in terms of 21st century economy. But you, you know, we have on the coast, you have really well-educated workers in tech and finance, and they've done brilliantly. Um, and in other parts of the country, including across the South, you have low-skilled populations that have kind of grown increasingly anti-immigrant, um, but also that was happening in its very slow economic recovery and a lot of um, wage stagnation. So I do think, you know, this overlapping of the geography, the politics, and kind of the economics is, is really important to keep in mind. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Rosalind. Look, before I go to Darren, I just want to ask you one more question focusing on the domestic side of this, because most of our discussion, we're going to move on and look at the foreign policy dimensions of this issue. But occasionally, when those of us in Australia who get, you know, worry a bit about the way in which reform, a policy reform has become much harder in Australia in recent years, we look at America and we feel much better about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, you, know, whether, you know, whether it's healthcare or taxation or the structure of the budget or social security, as you say, uh, nothing seems to be able to be done these days. There doesn't seem to be a middle ground. Do you see that changing at all? Because if it can't change, of course, the consequences for uh, America are very significant. Yeah, I mean, I always say like the politics is a lot harder than the economics. <laughs> so I don't know that I have a great answer. I think one thing to keep in mind is we have a federal system. So even while the federal government has been, you know, really drifting and, and really at odds with each other, there's a lot of things going on at the state level and, and there's still quite a lot of control. So infrastructure investment happens largely at the state level. There's a lot of different kinds of policies that can happen at the state level. So there is this sort of sense that even while Washington is kind of, um, you know, very preoccupied and very stuck, um, there still are other levels of government that have proved a bit more responsive. Um, that said, you know, it's, it's not great when, you know, your Congress, your executive branch um, cannot seem to find ways to compromise and move forward on, on things that people basically agree on, like, you know, infrastructure spending. Um, so I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm hopeful President-elect Biden, you know, has some, you know, very significant deep experience on the Hill. Um, he's bringing in a very experienced team. Um, I think there's a sense that we could be doing more to deliver for the American middle class. Um, and that these swerves back and forth across these two partisan divides is, you know, really not a particularly healthy place to be. That said, we live in a, you know, really tumultuous media environment um, with, you know, lots of 
you know, crazy stuff that's happening and it doesn't, it's hard to know if the parties can come together in the, you know, in the public, you know, realm to agree on things. It's almost like agreeing on things is, is bad. All right, Rosalind, uh, thanks very much, Darren. I want to bring you in and just get a bit of an Australian lens on this issue. So I've got a couple of questions about the middle class in Australia, but, but Darren, before we get to those, um, you and I have talked before and you think a lot about this problem of um, American gridlock and polarisation and whether uh, we are actually seeing an America in decline. How much do you see uh, the possibility of change in the American political system uh, from, from your perch in Australia? Oh, gosh, it is a very fragmented society. And I mean, the fact that Donald Trump won even more votes in, in terms of raw total in 2020 compared to 2016, I think highlights um, that fact. And so I don't, there is no easy solution. Uh, and I think that's why conversations like this are so important because to win back that, that kind of shared sense of purpose, to win back a common identity is going to require making people feel more comfortable and giving them, you know, the, the report that Rosalind contributor edited is very clear on this, you know, regaining their trust. And that's a very slow, painful process with a political system that is, you know, very ill-equipped at the moment to provide that. Uh, and so I think the pathway out is going to, going to be about, you know, improving the lives of ordinary Americans, but it's, it's a very long process if it can be even successful. Okay, well, let's look at Australia. Do you, do you see parallels between the US experience and ours here in Australia? I mean, do you think our middle class is in crisis and is globalisation uh, having such an effect on the middle class in Australia that it's shaping our own um, domestic politics? I don't think so. I, I wouldn't describe it as being in crisis. I mean, I think there are echoes and some parallels. I think it's worth putting out a definition of what it means to be in the middle class, which is between 75 and 200% of the median income, which in Australia, uh, if you're an, a single individual, is a bit over $33,000, which is not a lot of money. In fact, it's about 5% more than the minimum wage. So you can be in the middle class, and I think we can all agree, not necessarily very comfortable. Middle class earnings, of, uh, like in the US, are growing much slower than those of the wealthy, but they are still growing. I guess that's one contrast. Um, but I think there are some major structural differences that distinguish the two countries. One, you know, economic performance. The Australian economy has done very well over the past 30 years, and I think that has it's blunted some of the impacts of manufacturing decline that we have experienced. But also, as you said, Richard, earlier, we have a much stronger social safety net, better public services. And I think also we have few of the maybe just less acute social, social and cultural challenges that we have in the United States. So we have, I think, generally a more cohesive society and partly because we're much smaller. So I think the main echo, though, the main parallel is in some disaffection with mainstream politics and the mainstream political parties. You have seen a declining primary vote share for the two major parties. But one difference is that no one can actually agree on an alternative. You haven't seen an organized political force that represents some kind of middle-class backlash either to take over a major political party like you saw with the GOP in the US or create a durable, successful political party of its own. There have certainly been attempts, but they haven't been able to uh, durably succeed. So I th it's your second question in terms of, you know, how is globalization affecting our domestic politics and its impact on the middle class? I think we are one of the archetypal globalist countries, like or we have been. You know, we have long recognised that openness to trade, to finance, and yes, to some extent, migration is a net positive for the country. And you see that reflected in polling data. And we've also recognised that the international system of rules and institutions that help facilitate and create the global economy have been in it to our benefit and to, the, to our national interest. So I don't think you've seen as much of an effect. And if you take the two biggest sort of single issues of globalization, you know, trade and, and, and migration, and you look at them through the lens of a middle-class voter, you generally see healthy majorities of the Australian public saying that both have been on average on net good for Australia. 
So I do think our current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has shifted or adjusted the rhetoric of government around globalisation to give it a slightly sceptical hue. But I'm not sure that's been driven from a bottom-up political pressure from the middle class, but more trying to preempt that kind of pressure from building in the first place. And we can talk more about that uh, later if you wish. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, Darren. And uh, I, I really agree with that. I think, you know, when you look at the opinion polling, even in the current year, it's quite striking how strong the support for, for trade is, even, even where there are concerns about jobs. Um, well, Rosalind, we've sort of looked inwards a bit, uh, but I want to turn outwards now and just ask you how this sense of, of great challenge and, and a fading opportunity has influenced how the US middle class sees foreign policy and the role of America in the world. I mean, what, what does the middle class want from foreign policy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth, um, you know, it's, um, Darren's point is kind of interesting, you know, the differences between the US and Australia. You know, the US is just a huge place, it's a huge economy, very diversified, you know, has a huge internal market itself. Um, and so, you know, it's never, you know, it's not one of the more open economies, right? I mean, we're open in the sense that we have low tariffs, but, you know, exports plus imports over, so, you know, as a share of GDP is not nearly as high in the United States as you might expect, but it has been growing. So it's a gradual um, increase in the way in which the US is becoming more integrated globally, but it's still fairly slow and it is a little bit more moderate than in other places. Um, and I think that's sort of reflected in the way the US middle class tends to view US foreign policy. So, you know, the US middle class can usually just get by like living kind of its own lives, you know, not maybe as connected or as, you know, follow kind of foreign policy that closely. Um, but what we really heard, I think for the most part was pretty heartening. You know, I think most American middle class families are pretty pragmatic. Um, they see, you know, open free trade as basically a good thing. It's creating economic opportunities in a general sense. Um, and they also have, um, you know, kind of this, I think this kind of support for this enlightened self-interest, you know, that goes with, you know, being a leader of an open and free trading um, um, system, you know, and some of the benefits that have accrued to the United States from that global leadership, I think that's basically appreciated. Um, and I think that there's some appreciation for the fact that the United States has served as a, you know, basically a positive and a constructive force in the world. So I, all of those things are present. Um, and there's awareness um, and appreciation for them. But um, when you really kind of ask very specifically, how is foreign policy affecting you? What you tend to get are um, conversations about trade um, and actually to some extent national defense, the military. Those seem to be the two that kind of come most immediately to mind for um, an American middle class household. So we can start with trade for a second. Um, so, you know, middle class Americans, they hold pretty nuanced and diverse views on trade, um, which might surprise people, but it, it, it shouldn't because it really you know, very much depends on where you sit. So, for example, when we were speaking with people in Nebraska, um, which is a very big agricultural state, you know, they were quite heavily dependent on exports and they're, they follow world markets, especially commodity markets, very closely. They're very concerned about maintaining access to those markets. They were actually quite worried about um, the Trump administration's trade war with China, although they were actually quite supportive of getting sort of tough on China. They wanted to see <laughs> that trade war wrap up um, because that was really very risky from their standpoint the longer that went on. Um, Nebraskan farmers are actually pretty supportive of immigration as well because they you know, really rely on seasonal labor to support farming operations. So even though it's a you know, deeply red state, um, you know, it was not 100% supportive of the, the trade war with China, and it's not particularly 100% supportive of anti-immigration programs that have also been put forward by the Trump administration. In Ohio, um, there's lots of areas that are very concerned about foreign competition and trade practices, ones that have been hit hard, particularly in manufacturing, and they see, you know, some foreign competition and trade as a you know, direct threats to US jobs. It's very real and very concrete for them. But other parts of the, the same state, Ohio, like Cincinnati, very diverse economic base, 
have lots of foreign students coming in to study at local universities. There's lots of services, businesses that have good export opportunities, and so they're very supportive. And then you have a place like Colorado, where right, you have groups that are very strong on environmental stewardship and want to see us rejoin Paris. And then you have places like Colorado Springs, which is huge in defense spending and aerospace. And then you have fracking and mining areas that are all into US energy production. So it's all over the place, depending on where you sit, depending on where you live. Um, so I wouldn't say it's monolithic. Um, it's, there is a lot of nuance, um, depending on, on where you live, how you make your living. Um, but generally, there's a sense that trade is pre presents some good economic opportunities. That said, there's still a lot of concern that the American government is not doing enough to protect American jobs. So that we've opened up to trade too much, too freely, too quickly. We don't have good adjustment mechanisms. We don't have good safety nets. We're not doing enough to help communities adjust. Uh, we're not doing enough to help workers adjust. We're not doing enough to invest in the competitiveness of American communities. And we heard that pretty much loud and clear. So I would say that's kind of on the trade side. The other one I mentioned was national security. I think that's interesting because um, I don't think people maybe understand that there are a lot of really good middle class jobs that are connected to US military spending. Um, and that's just you know a very pragmatic bottom line thing, right? There's huge um, armaments, you know, production in a place like Lima, Ohio, right, which puts out tanks. And Lima, Ohio is quite aware that tank production is maybe not the industry of the future, um, right? But they don't necessarily want to see defense spending cut. They, they'd like to see reinvestment in Lima. They'd like to see, right, their, this defense community, in which they take a lot of pride, continue but they know it has to evolve. And, and so there's, I think there's a lack of faith and trust, as you mentioned, in the government's ability to manage these transitions for American households and make trade work better for people. Okay, thanks a lot, um, Rosalind. Now, just, I just wanted to look at uh, policy making because there's a, there's a great line in your report where you say that the, the foreign policy establishment uh, sat in security and economic silos, uh, which is a phrase that will resonate to some, at least in Australia, and <laughs> trailed behind a changing world. Lovely phrase that. So how did, so it's really a critique of orthodox foreign and economic policy making. And so, you know, how do you think that disconnect happened and uh, are there lessons for other countries here? Yeah, I don't even know if it happened so much as it was kind of always there. And then just as the world got more complex and the need to integrate foreign and domestic policy became more important, we just haven't really been able to adjust. So just on a personal level, maybe to make it more concrete for people. Um, you know, I worked in U.S. Uh, economic intelligence for a bunch of, you know, three, four years. And, um, you know, I spent time worrying about 170 other countries beside my own, you know, everything, everything besides the United States. I don't think we, you know, kind of as a rule, really spent any time thinking about the domestic distributional effects of many of the events, risks, scenarios that we were concerned about. And then I went over to Treasury and I was in the US macro side, and we never once worried about anything to do with foreign events, global shocks, or anything else. And I literally, my two worlds, you know, I just crossed the street and they just didn't even speak to each other anymore. It was just always felt like it was somebody else's job to make all these connections. Um, and that's just, you know, we really need to, to fix some of that. It, it, on a more abstract level, I mean, you can see it pretty easily if you read, which I have you know, the past 40 years of US national security strategies. I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it, um, but um, it exposes the gap, you know, between kind of the foreign policy frame and the national security frame and kind of the economic policy. And so what you'll see a lot of is the US national interest is almost always framed in terms of like economic strength, which of course is like, you know, who's not gonna be for economic strength, right? But there's very little regard for kind of the shape and the character of the economy or how, um, what economic security of middle-class households look like. It's almost always there's sort of these kind of 
phrases about economic strength, and then the whole document just moves into, you know, security, geopolitical competition, you know, technology, weapon systems, the whole thing. Um, you know, and obviously geopolitical competition matters a lot for U.S. national security, but so does, you know, the long-term economic security of a very large, you know, middle class um, for social stability, political stability, and every other reason, right? So, um, you know, I think when we talk about these silos, I mean, I, I think everybody in government anywhere kind of nods, but we really do need to do better with this. We had one recommendation in the, um, in the report, which I think a lot of members of the task force and even got picked up in a few other places liked, which was this idea of a national competitiveness strategy. So instead of just thinking about the national security strategy, really thinking a little bit harder about how do we actually knit together domestic and foreign policy priorities and tools um, to uh, you know, improve national competitiveness um, more holistically, not just national security, but national competitiveness, you know, as a source of national security. Okay. Oh, and Please actually, I think you asked me about lessons for other countries, but I, I really, I don't think I know. Um, you know, uh, if we can get our own house in order, then we will for sure to go on the road with, with everything that we learn. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Don't hold your breath. Darren, I want to ask you the policy making question in a minute because I know that you are an astute observer of our own system. But before we get to that, um, could we talk a little bit about how you see Australia's middle class and foreign policy? Do, I mean, do you see the middle class as <clears throat> having a distinct uh, set of foreign policy? Um, preferences? Does the middle class shape foreign policy or, or do, in your view do you, do you see it really as an elite uh, preoccupation? I think, I think both. The, the preferences that I described earlier, I think there has been an alignment um, of the middle class and the, the public more broadly with the basic tenets of Australian foreign policy. What's changed, uh, at least in the last few years under this Prime Minister, as I foreshadowed earlier, is how foreign policy is framed. And he has done, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, has been relentless in, in framing Australian foreign policy through the explicit lens of national interest, you know, in our interest, what's in our national interest. He says it all the time in response to every question, we will do what's in our interest. And I, I think, you know, my theory of this is that that reflects a recognition um, of the kinds of pressures that have been building in places like the United States or, or in Europe um, and the PM getting out in front of that a little bit, which I think aligns also with his own beliefs about the world and that Australia's actions on the international stage need to be connected back to that lived experience of ordinary Australians. Morrison's quiet Australians. Otherwise, those actions will lack the legitimacy um, of the public. But as I said earlier, I, I see this as more of a rhetorical shift rather than a concrete policy shift and one that's been driven by middle class pressures. There is one glaring exception, of course, which is climate change. You know, I don't see strong evidence um, that the middle class explicitly supports or is pushing the government to be such an outlier um, on emissions reductions and on you know, zero um, carbon neutrality uh, policies. I think that's driven ideologically from inside the party itself, but perhaps with the voters not having it a sufficiently high enough priority overall um, to, to punish the government for its stance. Can I just ask you a, a subsidiary question on this? Um, as you know, one of the big ideas in the foreign policy white paper and full, full disclosure here, because you'll know that I had a role in shaping it, was this idea of openness that Australia uh, gained considerably from being open to the world, not, not absolutely, but as much as possible, whether it was trade or investment or migration or even um, ideas and, ca and capital. Uh, and of course, openness is an idea that's really come under a lot of pressure in the past few years, uh, sort of running against the tide, if you like, of the anti-globalisation sentiment, the economic nationalism we've seen, not just in America, but in other parts of the world. But, you know, in Australia, it's, it's survived, it's a little bit dented, but, you know, do you, do you think that there is still broad public support for that idea of openness? And the white paper, of course, says that 
Australia should remain open even if other countries begin to close their markets. I, I do. I think there are increasing qualifications on openness. Uh, for example, the way in which asylum seekers arrive in the country, Australians care very much about that process, which has been a very politi powerful political a tool for you know, successive governments. Um, on foreign investment, I think the public largely accepts the national security exceptions um, that, are, that drive decision-making, for example, on, on, on 5G telecommunications networks. So I think the public still supports openness in principle, but is very happy to carve out exceptions for Australia, um, where, you know, and the government has persuaded them that, that these are necessary. All right. Well, let's. Can we turn about? Can we turn to the policy making uh, part of the equation here? And I know that you know you and Alan Gingell have chewed this over quite a lot uh, in your podcast. But do you see the same kind of critique of foreign policy making that Rosalind has uh, in her report? Is the Australian system, you know, also trailing behind a changing world and clinging to? orthodoxy when, when really it should be doing something else. I do think there is a disconnect, but I don't think it has been too consequential yet. Uh, I think that policy making elites, and I, yeah, I've said this to, to Alan, a 50 year veteran of Australian foreign policy, that I think elites have been less willing to face the political ramifications of the changing you know, politics of the middle class. Um, and the example I come back to is in the, the critical commentary around Prime Minister Morrison's infamous negative globalism speech that he gave in October of 2019, where he was sort of, it's seemingly rhetorically critical of, of, of global elites and, and, and of, of international institutions to some extent. Um, and you saw some pushback that from the establishment and I think less of an acknowledgement about the way it was trying to speak to some of these grievances of, of the middle class. Who that the grievances that they have with the status quo model and, and in recognition that things do need to change. But I wouldn't characterise this disconnect as so much of a failure because I don't think we have been tested yet. Yeah, the pressures on Australia, unlike in the United States, are not strong enough. And it's not just the Prime Minister who's recognising something. You're seeing key members on the, on, the, on the opposition side in the Labor Party also recognising that they need to frame the challenges of foreign policy differently. I want to add one point, though, which is that this sort of the backlash against the status quo, whether that's domestically or, or internationally and whether, and, or against politicians or against elites, it's so broad and, and hard to pin down it. And, and I think it's, it exists regardless of specific causes. And so I think, and we've discussed this before, Richard, that the, the, the international system and globalization have been a bit of a scapegoat um, for what are genuine struggles um, and grievances of, of the middle class and of mass publics everywhere. But in many cases, they're not the cause and it's technology and, and, and secular changes in the labor market that are the main drivers of the struggles that are being experienced. But if that's true, if foreign policy is not as much of the cause and we can debate that in the China shock and things like that, but if it's not much of the cause, it's also probably not much of the solution. And the goal, for me, one of the most interesting things about the, the Carnegie series of reports is that in some sense, I read them as almost seeking to insulate foreign policy from this critique to some extent, you know, in the sense of rebuilding trust and rebuilding credibility, rather than necessarily that foreign policy is the solution to improving the lives of the middle class. And I'm not sure if that's a thread you want to pull on. Well, that's a very good place, I think, to come back to you, Rosalind, because your report is not just about understanding the problem. There's a lovely American phrase that I used to hear a lot when I was posted in Washington, which is <clears throat> stop admiring the problem and actually give me some ideas to do something about it. So you do uh, really try and grapple with policy, foreign policy responses, although the, you do also talk about domestic policy. There's way too much in your report uh, for us to sensibly cover here, but I, I wondered if you could just talk us briefly through a couple of the ideas uh, around uh, the model uh, of US global leadership on China, of course, which is really the biggest foreign policy issue now and forever, I suppose, for us all. Um, and also on, on trade policy, which you talked a bit about before. Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think, 
you know, if we think about kind of what the overarching um, kind of takeaway was, is that, you know, if we were to kind of recenter or reground US foreign policy and middle class interests, sort of advance those interests, it would lead to a somewhat more tempered, more disciplined foreign policy that really eschews, you know, major new conflicts and, and really tries to promote stability. Um, so in the near term, what might that mean? Um, so, you know, our view is that it would definitely mean reinvigorating relations with close allies, um, not in order to, you know, sort of express and project more power, but really to help protect um, the U.S. public from shocks that are coming in from abroad, um, to help improve coordination on common challenges, which would include climate change and um, refugee flows, um, and other border issues, and try to work with others to elevate middle class concerns. That might include things like trying to work around closing regulatory or jurisdictional gaps, like in taxes, for example, like tax haven use, that maybe feed inequities um, and kind of advantage large corporations or wealthy individuals over others. Um, I think it also suggests sort of the, the need to build back up the State Department, which has been in, you know, as is now in tatters, more or less. And maybe there's an opportunity there to do some reorganization around of the State Department um, around sort of new priorities, um, new authorities, new capabilities. I also think there's some, you know, appetite to continue to push on things like burden sharing. So the ability of the U.S. to sort of begin to share the burden um, with allies on a number of issues goes a long way toward helping Americans, um, you know, see this global leadership role as something worth doing. When, when there's a perception, even if it's not true, but if it's a wide perception that you know, there's a lot of free riding, um, that you know, the system is unfair, that the U.S. is bearing all the costs, it becomes very difficult at home politically to, to get you know, broad support for it. Um, obviously, it's going to mean coordinating kind of a global economic recovery um, from the pandemic. Um, I think it's going to mean, you know, looking toward the digital ecosystem. What do we need to do, you know, around the world to help kind of create a healthy, you know, digital economy going forward? Um, how, what are we going to do with our very formidable defense budgets? Um, you know, how are we going to actually work harder to make sure we're, you know, doing things around long term readiness and security um, as we kind of, I think, pull back from, you know, active military intervention in any kind of large scale way. Um, so I think all of those things are kind of big picture ones. In terms of China, you know, I think that's a really, it's, it's a long, it's a long game, right? Um, I don't think a simple reset back to maybe where we were four or eight years ago seems very possible. I mean, it feels like the train has left the station to some degree. And I think, you know, it's more an exercise in getting the train on a better track, right? So that we're not headed toward outright conflict. We're not in a, you know, an outright trade war, but we're working toward resolving some of the differences, working on some of the common problems that we have in managing some of the conflict um, um, in terms of things like unfair trade practices, IP theft, um, you know, some abuses around economic leverage or influence campaigns abroad, um, that whole set of issues. And then on trade, I mentioned before, um, you know, we tried to think of it more as a broader competitiveness agenda um, rather than just a trade policy agenda. Um, so this national competitiveness strategy would help to guide strategic investments in American workforce and infrastructure. Um, we'd also want to be pursuing perhaps some limited targeted trade deals, but they would need to really be able to deliver some tangible gains to middle class households. There's some, you know, recommendations for promoting small, medium sized businesses and in, in the export markets and some ways to think about doing trade enforcement better. And we have a lot of authorities, but they're all kind of in different places and we don't usually coordinate as well as we could. So there's some recommendations around that. Okay. Thanks, um, Rosalind. Darren, I wanted to come back to the point that you finished on, just to tease that out a bit more last when we had you last on, but so how much do you think should foreign policy 
have to bear the burden of protecting the middle classes uh, from some of these pressures? You know, is it enough for Australia, for example, just to focus on domestic policies uh, that try and mitigate some of these impacts of reduce inequality, provide safety nets, uh, transition plans for industry, improve competitiveness, or is it is it unwise to try and separate foreign and domestic policy out here? I think you should do all those things, but at the end of the day, what happens internationally is going to have massive impacts on those policy domains, whether you like it or not. So you do need international cooperation to solve certain global problems that have those local effects that will change the things that you're, you care about and whether that's climate change or health um, or in trade. And so I sort of would characterize the, the failure of, of foreign policy over the past sort of several decades as being one that enabled a lot of domestic policy failures. So, you know, the erosion of social protections and the safety nets that were constructed in the post-war period. Um, this idea that national governments would have the freedom um, to, to, to pursue full employment policies and, and, and develop welfare states, even as they agreed on global rules and joined institutions, that idea, those ideas I think got lost. You know, it's, it's called in political science, the, the idea of embedded liberalism, but you saw in the seventies and eighties, a rollback of the welfare state to the principle of sort of harmonizing policies across countries, you know, across, across borders. And that created a bit of a race to the bottom. So foreign policy has enabled domestic policy failure. Um, but there, there's always going to be a, a core tension between sovereignty and, and, and cooperation. Like the more that you insist on a freedom to act, the harder it's going to be to coordinate policies across, across nations. And so states are still going to have to sacrifice some sovereignty and sometimes a lot of sovereignty to solve global problems. The challenge is then to translate that you know, into a, a policy imperative that can persuade middle-class voters um, across the West in particular to get behind it. Thanks, Darren. Um, I'm conscious that we're beginning to run out of time and I do uh, want to get to a new American president before we finish. But Rosalind, I just wanted to uh, talk to you about one other aspect of your report that's very interesting. So much more than in Australia, American foreign policy, you know, is, is always animated by a very big idea. And your report uh, looks at some of those foreign policy paradigms as a post-Cold War liberal internationalism, President Trump's America first, and the newer progressive agenda of economic and social justice and climate change and so on. And where you seem to land, um, you need to combine internationalism with a more principled kind of nationalism than we got under Trump. It's more reform uh, than revolution. And I suppose the question I wanted to ask you is that, does that, does that look too centrist for the ages? Is, is it itself perhaps too unorthodox for those in the American uh, middle class who are wanting to see uh, greater change? Or do you think that there is support domestically uh, for a reformed policy framework? Um, I really like that phrase. I wish I'd come up with it. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the internet, I think, well, what, what did you call it? Uh, combined internationalism with more principled nationalism. Um, I think it's really very close to, to where we came down. Um, I just give you a sense, like um, there was a Gallup poll in February 2019, and it showed that 69% of Americans thought the United States should take a major or leading role in global affairs. And it might surprise people, but that number has been relatively stable for, um, for a decade. Um, there just really isn't a lot of public support for Trump's revolution, you know, in foreign policy. And it's called to abandon US allies, abdicate leadership. Um, so the American middle class, the broad American public, is not particularly supportive of the actual Trump's actions, whoops, to, um, to really, sorry, I lost my light here. I don't know. I'll have to be in the dark for a second. Um, the, you know, the administration's- it's getting light in America. Yeah, I'll, I'll get up and turn it on in a second. But um, the administration's, you know, deep rejection of, you know, a global role for the United States, that's not really widely supported 
Um, I think what is supported is broadly what you just said, which is kind of a return to some kind of pragmatic focus on national interests and kind of basic interests, as in, you know, what is good for the U.S. middle class? How do we actually, you know, engage in the global economy in ways that, uh, you know, promote job security, job stability, the creation of good jobs um, that takes some account of distributional concerns um, that, you know, is aware that of the need for social safety nets or at least some kind of adjustment mechanisms that are a little bit more, um, what's the word, honest about the fact that trade itself is highly redistributive process. Um, and, you know, it just doesn't, things just don't redistribute, you, know, you open up to trade, it's not automatic that the winners are going to compensate the losers. So, you know, we have to have a little bit better conversation about that. So, no, I actually don't think that a more centrist approach is out of sync with where the American people are. Um, it's going to be a little difficult um, in Washington because we've now had, you know, basically a decade of a lot of intransigence and partisanship. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the election, and we can get into that shortly, you know, is a move a little bit back toward a more centrist um, stance. Um, and, you know, I think you're going to see, I, I think you're going to see some willingness in Congress to, to make some progress in a few areas where I think the American public really wants to see some progress. All right. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, just before we go to uh, President-elect Biden, um, Darren, you know uh, better than most that there's a, a vigorous debate in the US system about um, what the point of America should be now uh, in this new world in terms of foreign policy. So do you see, uh, do you see yourself that America can find uh, a sense of shared purpose in its foreign policy that, that does find a path between the sort of narrow nationalism of Trump and the mistakes of imperial overreach that we've seen in the past? Mm. The the, the, what I want to say first, I think, is just I, to recognise a particular electoral result that was quite remarkable to me on this question of centrism versus non-centrism, and that was in Florida, where I think Trump won by four or five points. But a minimum wage um, a bill or amendment passed, uh, I think, with 60% of the vote. And so you had 10 or 15% of, of, of Trump voters who also wanted to see a minimum wage rise, which is traditionally a very left leaning policy. And so I do wonder whether many of the things that we might be thinking of as, as centrist uh, coming out of the report are actually have quite a lot of support among both progressive, the progressive left and much of the working class Trump right. Um, and that there actually may be a way of, of synthesizing them. Maybe just don't call it centrism. Um, in terms of the shared purpose, I mean, I think this is where the China comes into the, into the frame because the most likely pathway to that shared purpose, unfortunately, I think, is going to be some kind of uniting against an ideological adversary like China, which is what I think helped discipline US policy and the West generally during the Cold War. Now, that obviously is very concerning from the point of view of international stability, but history you know, shows us that it's the most likely frame through which you can get you know, a, a large majority of Americans on the same page. I don't see any other, you know, Prudent, careful policy making, I don't think is going to shake things up in a way that gets the attention of the middle class so that they suddenly come, become on board. I think the other option, if you're not going to sort of lead an ideological um, fight, is simply to sort of take foreign policy off centre stage and to, and to sort of try to build legitimacy for it quietly by framing it, as the report says, not so much as foreign policy, but as revitalising, you know, local communities. So I think they're your two options, either, either China or, um, or taking it, um, not making it foreign policy anymore. Thanks, Darren. Yes, we should ban the word centre, shouldn't we? Uh, it starts a fight automatically. Uh, all right. Uh, well, Rosalind, just in time, uh, we've come to, uh, a new, we have a new president or a new president-elect, um, and he talks literally, as I said earlier, about um, a foreign policy for the middle class. So uh, he's got a huge job ahead of him, of course, a smashed economy, there's the pandemic, uh, there's the polarisation, 
before he even gets to thinking about foreign policy. So where do you see things going from here? What do you think we'll see from uh, Joe Biden and his team? And I just want to recognise that John Preston uh, had submitted a similar question, noting that um, uh, Trump's probably reinforced uh, middle-class jaundice about international engagement by sort of attacking uh, Trump's part, uh, America's partners and peak international bodies and so on. And so can Biden galvanise support for American middle class around his foreign policy? Yeah, so um, I think it's worth noting, right? So um, President-elect Biden wrote an article in The Atlantic, uh, I think it was last spring, um, I think it was, I don't remember the title, but it you know, was very much about this topic, which is how do we think about foreign policy for the middle class? And partly that's because a member of our task force, Jake Sullivan, is a very, very close advisor and now you know, is the designated national security advisor for the president elect. So these ideas um, that the task force has been thinking about for the last three years have been actually making their way into, for sure, the Biden campaign. I think in some sense um, they've animated, you know, much of the Trump campaign and Trump administration too. Um, so I do think that they are more than lip service, right? There is, it, it might sound like a nice little campaign slogan, right? We're for the middle class, uh, but I actually think this is a little bit more longstanding and more genuine um, and more central to the Biden administration um, and to several of the, you know, very key advisors. So. You know, in terms of what that might mean, um, you know, I think it does mean, I think we are seeing, you know, people being appointed who are pretty committed to the U.S. engaging with close allies. Um, I think trying to reintegrate the U.S. back into the global community. Um, but I do think you'll see that done in a way that is cautious and cognizant of distributional concerns. Um, so I think, you know, the idea that we'll just slide right back into TPP, that does not seem to me, you know, super realistic. Um, I think, you know, uh, on, on climate, I'm not sure. I mean, it seems I mean, he's, well, the president-elect has already said, you know, pretty clearly that he wants to go back into Paris, but those were fairly voluntary, <laughs> um, you know, uh, um, measures that we had signed up for. But I do think there'll be some green energy types of stuff that'll happen and maybe that will be linked back to community development and other things. So I, I do think you're gonna see a little bit more of these concerns um, integrated into uh, the foreign policy agenda of the Biden administration. Okay, well, we've only got a couple of minutes to go. Uh, Darren, I just wanna give you the last word. Um, when you think about um, the way in which America so significantly shapes global debate uh, on just about everything, and particularly uh, foreign policy in Australia, you know, how much do you think a Biden administration will roll back the, the, the sense of a world in which globalisation was ret retreat, in which economic nationalism was legitimate, in which uh, sovereign states were back and centre at the expense of multilateral cooperation. I mean, do you think yourself that um, uh, that, that reflects deeper structural trends that uh, will remain even if they're a bit gentler and kindler? Or do you see um, Biden as really shifting the landscape? No, I think it's, it's the former, um, a gentler, kindler kind of version, um, but still a, a real change. Uh, a return to normality, you know, engagement with allies, re-engagement with institutions is certainly important. But I think you're going to see, firstly, much more of an emphasis on working with trusted security partners than the old international system on big questions. So you'll be working outside maybe the United Nations or the large organisations on increasingly important measures, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the return or the rise of the Five Eyes type security groupings as, as, as trusted networks. And you're also going to see, I think, you know, to follow what Rosalind was saying, more policy that is, is, is not conducted through 
institutions as much, but that is carved out for each individual state to, you know, or at least that the United States wishes to carve out for itself, regardless of what institution, international rules and institutions are saying. So that's not trashing the order the way Trump is doing it, but saying that there is, we need a larger space to operate within that order. So I think, you know, but still, the optics of, of re-engaging with the system are important. Um, you know, China is certainly looking itself to, to engage with the order you know, heavily. And so it's important that the United States also does so. But no, we're, I think it's a, the change is permanent. All right. Well, look, we, we have uh, run out of time. Apologies to Sean Innes. I failed in my duties as moderator by not paying attention to the chat box. <laughs> Rule number one. Uh, however, Sean, I look forward to discussing that issue <clears throat> over our next lunch, that question you asked. Uh, but we've kept Darren and Rosalind for a long time. We've worked them so hard. Uh, poor old Rosalind is now sitting in the dark in the Naval Academy <laughs> in Annapolis in a ruthlessly energy efficient building that is te telling her <laughs> time to go home. Uh, so, Rosalind, thanks so much for staying on a bit late uh, to join us today. Uh, Darren, thank you for joining us. Uh, really appreciated uh, having you uh, here with us. I really enjoyed that conversation. Now we will, we have recorded this, so we will be posting this and promoting it because it was a fascinating uh, discussion. And again, I encourage you for those who are interested, uh, have a look at the report that Rosalind and her colleagues did. Uh, and if you're interested in these kinds of issues, uh, Darren and Alan Gingell uh, really go hard at them uh, in the wonderful Australia in the World podcast. So Darren and Rosalind, thanks so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Richard. And we'll see you all again. Bye.